Uh, welcome all. So it's uh, it's our great privilege that Professor Burnt uh, is uh, has is giving the talk. So let me read out his brief bio. So he needs no introduction, but let me do the formality. Professor Bruce C. Burnt joined the faculty of the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign in 1967. After 52 years of teaching and research at the University of Illinois, he retired in May 2019. During this time, he supervised the doctoral dissertations of 37 students. He is a former Guggenheim Fellow, and he received the Steele Prize for Mathematical Exposition from the American Mathematical Society in 1996. In 2012, Professor Byrne became a Fellow of the American Mathematical Society. Also in 2012, he received an honorary doctorate from the Shastra University in Kumbhakonam, India. He has published five volumes on Ramanujan's notebooks with Springer between 1985 and 1998. And he and George Andrews have published five volumes on Ramanujan's lost notebook with Springer in between 2005 and 2018. Professor Burnt inaugurated and co-chaired the first RMIT conference in 2009. And uh, again, it's, it's our honor that, you know, so to see him back. So Professor Burnt will speak on the circle pro problem of Gauss, the divisor problem of Dirichle, and Ramanujan's interest in them. Over to Professor Burnt. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. I would first like to express my concern and thoughts for the millions of families who are suffering from economic difficulties, serious illness, and death due to COVID-19. These are the three topics of my lecture, but I will talk about current developments after I talk about uh, these topics. So the Gauss circle problem is a very famous unsolved problem as the Dirichlet divisor problem. And Ramanujan was definitely interested in these two problems. So I will in particular tell you about two formulas published with the Lost Notebook that have been in, intrigued me for almost 20 years. So there are four photographs of Ramanujan. So this is the most uh, frequently used photograph. It's his passport, a picture taken prior to his return to India. It looks like he has a suit coat on, but this is actually a bathrobe. And these are his pajamas. He was too sick to go to the photographer to have his uh, photograph taken for his passport. The photograph, the photographer had to come to the nursing home to take his picture. Okay, so I'd like to begin with the fourth item from Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy. So Ramanujan said 1, 2, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 13, 16, 17, 18 are numbers which are either squares uh, or can be expressed as a sum of two squares. And he then gives this formula for the number of, of such numbers be greater than A and less than B. And the constant in front of the integral, he says, is 0.764. Uh, theta x is very small compared with the integral. And he says he's exactly found these, though complicated. Note there's a slight misprint here. He should have uh, theta of b rather than uh, theta of x. Uh, so let me quote Hardy, what he had to say about this result. He said the dominant term, that is kb log b to the minus one half, in Ramanujan's notation was first obtained by Landau in 1908. Ramanujan had none of Landau's weapons at his command. It is sufficiently marvelous that he should have even dreamt of problems such as these, problems which it has taken the finest mathematicians in Europe a hundred years to solve. And uh, I would just like to second Hardy's opinion. This really is a remarkable uh, feat because usually in any field of mathematics or any other endeavor, um, the field blow, um, just develops slowly one uh, you know, research after another. So here, Ramanujan reached this stage, which would have been a stage you know, reached by any group of, or a group of mathematicians after many years, all of a sudden he made this leap with no background at all 
uh, in this area. So here's a photograph of Hardy. And Watson uh, also uh, was extremely enthusiastic about this. He's a little bit in typical British understatement here. The most amazing thing about this formula is that it was discovered apparently independently, and let me say it, certainly independently by Ramanujan in his early days in India. And it appears in its appropriate place in his manuscript notebooks. Yeah. Here is a photograph of uh, G.N. Watson. I'll come back to him later in my lecture. Well, I've actually taken a scan of the photo of the page in Ramanujan's notebooks uh, where this problem is discussed. And you see it's very faintly uh, written at the bottom of the page. You can make out uh, the integral here that he gave in his first letter to Hardy. And there are some more, uh, there's more exposition here, but it's very difficult to read. Yeah. When the new edition of Ramanujan's notebooks was published in 2012, uh, this last statement became, became much clearer. So uh, Ramanujan gives a formula for the constant. Uh, he has C now, but note that the formula is incomplete. He has one in four different factors here, but he doesn't tell us what really follows the one. Okay, so here I've written it out uh, exactly as it's given in Ramanujan's notebooks on page 307. So again, these are missing as to what these uh, expressions in the radical are. Yeah. And then there were some uh, numbers here, three, seven, I'm not sure quite what they represent. And he has a nine, seven, it looks like an epsilon under the equality side. Well, as it turns out, there is another place in the notebooks where this uh, is discussed. It's actually in the third notebook. The third notebook has just 33 pages of unorganized material. So here he gives the constant and I have returned to his notation in his letter to Hardy. So you can see that uh, involves a product here of all primes uh, running uh, all primes um, of the form four M plus three uh, out to infinity. Yeah. So really surprisingly, Ramanujan sketches a proof of this claim in the third notebook. And there's more space, uh, in fact, the entire page devoted to this proof than any other argument or proof in the entire, in the notebooks. Yeah. So throughout the notebooks, there are about 3,200 different claims. A couple places, Ramanujan indicates uh, his argument, uh, just a very few of these places, but here he actually gives uh, the uh, proof not quite rigorous, but it really is an argument that can be put in uh, rigorous terms. So this notebook might not have been available to Hardy and Watson. Uh, Watson made his own personal copy of the second notebook, but uh, to the best of our knowledge, he didn't make a copy of the third notebook. Well, that's a matter of introduction to the circle problem. So the uh, what I've given you so far is not the circle problem, but it indicates Ramanujan's interest in sums of squares. Yeah. So we'll let R2 of N be the number of representations of the positive integer N as a sum of two squares. We count different signs in different orders as distinct. So if we take five, you can write as plus or minus two squared plus plus or minus one squared, but then you can invert the order of the ones and the twos. So altogether then uh, R2 of five is equal to eight. And you can take every, each representation of N as a sum of two squares and associate it with a lattice point in the plane. So five is then minus two squared plus one squared, for example. And we associate that with the lattice point minus two one. And then each lattice point can be associated with a unit square. 
So there are four possibilities. It doesn't make any difference which one we take. We just should be consistent. So we'll take the square associated with the lattice point such that the lattice point is in the southwest corner of this square. So in this picture, then I'm looking at all the lattice points in a circle of radius square root x. So in each case, the lattice, the square associated with the lattice point is such that the lattice point is in the southwest corner. Yeah. Okay, so if I want to know, you know, how many points are in this square, uh, this is exactly equal to because the squares have area one, the, some of the areas of these squares. Or in other words, if I look at all uh, representations R2 of n, again, that's the number of representations of n as a sum of two squares, and I sum over all n less than or equal to x, uh, we'll take R2 of zero to be one. Then remembering that the circle has radius square root uh, x, uh, an approximation for that number will be pi times x. But there, of course, there will be a remainder. So the prime on the summation sign indicates that if x is an integer, we only count a half uh, r2 of x. It turns out that in the analysis of this problem, this is the sum that naturally appears rather than the sum without the prime. Well, Gauss was the first person to examine this problem. So he noted that R of X, the sum, is certainly less than pi times square root of X plus square root of two squared. Yeah. And uh, it's greater than pi times square root of X minus square root of two squared. Or in other words, if you take the circle of radius square root X plus square root two, uh, all the squares are in that circle. And if you take this circle, all of uh, the inside of the circle is colored red. Yeah. So if you take these two inequalities and put them together, you get that Rx is pi x as you would expect. And then the error term is big O of square root of x. Yeah. So it's, some of you might not be familiar with the big O notation, let me just briefly explain it. So we say that f of x is big O of g of x, usually as x tends to infinity. If there are constants c and x zero, such that for x greater than or equal to x zero, the absolute value of f of x is less than or equal to c times the absolute value of g. So here our uh, f uh, is going to be the error term, p of x, and the g is going to be square root of x. Okay, well, Hardy was also greatly interested in this problem. And he wrote a paper in 1915, so this would be in the year after Ramanujan arrived in England. And he recorded this uh, identity for the sum of R of X. So this is the Bessel function of order one. I define here the uh, ordinary Bessel function of order nu. And then uh, Hardy says, the form of this equation was suggested to me by Mr. S. Ramanujan, to whom I had communicated the analogous formula for d of one plus d of two through d of n, where d of n is the number of divisors of n. I've always found this statement very strange because Hardy says the form of this equation was suggested to me. Well, if you have the form of the equation, you certainly have the equation itself because you wouldn't guess anything like this if you really knew what the identity is. So certainly Ramanujan then did have the identity and he, he just he gave it to Hardy. Now, by the way, this is the only place uh, that the identity uh, of Ramanujan is recorded. In other words, he doesn't have it in any of his papers or his earlier notebooks or his lost notebook. Yeah. So this is actually the main tool that one uses to get upper bounds for the error term. And what one does is to take an asymptotic, the asymptotic formula 
for j nu substitutes in this Craig, Craig function. Uh, this part is easily handled. Uh, you can estimate the convergence series very easily just by absolute values. But the part involving the cosine gives you a series which is not absolutely convergent. So the behavior of the series is not obvious by any means. But Sierpinski actually used a, a similar result to get an upper bound for the error term of big O of square root of uh, cube root of X. And the best result that we have, as far as I know, is due to Huxley in 2003. Uh, so he showed the error term is big O of X to the 131 over 416 plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. Uh, so I've given the uh, decimal expansion of 131 over 416. So note that in 114 years, all we've been able to do is to reduce 0.333, et cetera, to 0.3149. In other words, we've managed to whittle down our upper bound for the error term by less than two hundredths. Well, in Hardy's paper, uh, he states this beautiful formula of Ramanujan. And again, this is not given anywhere in Ramanujan's work other than Hardy's paper. It really is a beautiful formula. Now, if you don't think this is a beautiful formula, I'm sorry, you're just not a mathematician. This is a beautiful formula. Why is it so beautiful? Well, if you take the left side, we just uh, invert the uh, orders of A and B, you get something, you get an equality. It's very seldom in mathematics that you can get an equality by just reversing the roles of two parameters. So it really is a beautiful formula. So here we have two formulas of Ramanujan that do not appear anywhere else. And so one asks the natural question, are there formulas of Ramanujan that have been lost that are not in his notebooks or published papers? Uh, maybe he gave them to Hardy, or maybe he just didn't uh, give them to anyone. So. Well, Hardy actually used this formula. If we differ differentiate this formula with respect to B, you let A tend to zero, make a substitution, replace, uh, say, two pi square root B by S. Now think of this as a function of a complex variable and use analytic continuation then we get this identity. So this was the main identity that Hardy used to get an estimate from below for the error term. I should add that Hardy also had another proof of this identity. So what Hardy showed was that the error term is omega plus minus x to the one quarter. So the omega notation is likely not familiar to you, so let me explain that. So on the plus side, this means there exists a positive constant C1 in some sequence Xn tending to infinity, such that on the sequence P of Xn, the error term is greater than C, a constant C1 Xn to the one quarter. And then on the minus sign, this means there exists another constant C2 in another sequence tending to infinity, such that on the sequence, the error term is less than minus C2 uh, Xn prime to the one quarter. So here it can become very large, here it can become very small, well, small in terms uh, of a negative sign. Okay, so this shows that X to the one quarter is not possible because you have these sequences uh, that would contradict that if, if you made that assumption. But we think this is closer to the truth uh, than the upper bound. So in other words, the error term is, we think, it's big O of X to the one quarter plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero as X tends to infinity. But we've hardly improved upon Hardy's result. We've put some logarithm terms here, but that's all we have and as an improvement on Hardy's result. So, so this is Hardy's paper uh, uh, in the Quarterly Journal of Math at uh, Oxford. Okay. 
Okay, let me um, give an elementary formula for that summatory function. So this is a formula for R2 of n that's often taught in an elementary course on the theory of numbers. So I want to put that in R of x. So I let R2 of n be this formula, but I write it in a different way. I write it as a sum of sine pi d over two. You can easily check that that's exactly what I have here. And every integer n, which has divisor d, um, will then look at the integer j such, in other words, I'm writing d n as just dj. So we have the sum over all pairs dj less than or equal to x. But now I'll sum on j. And since the sum ands do not depend upon j, then the sum is just square brackets of x over d, where square brackets of x is the greatest integer function, the greatest integer less than or equal to x. Yeah. Okay, now with that in mind, uh, I'd like to go to a, an identity for R2 of n found in a one page manuscript published with Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. So the Lost Notebook was published first in 1988. And not only was the Lost Notebook published at that time, there were many other uh, manuscripts, scraps of ma uh, manuscripts uh, that were published with the Lost Notebook. So here is just a one page fragment, uh, it's page 335 in the Neurosa edition. And I've scanned it. So this is the formula, or there are two formulas here. Okay, I'll explain these. I won't depend upon you for just reading them. So uh, I'm going to define a function f of x to be square brackets of x if x is not an integer and x minus a half if x is an integer. So this uh, formula was first proved by uh, Sun Kim and Alexander Zaharescu and myself in 2013. Um, Zaharescu is my colleague at the University of Illinois and Sun Kim is my former PhD student. Okay, here's a photograph of Sun Kim uh, with me at her graduation at uh, getting her PhD at Illinois. And this is the first formula from that one page manuscript published with Ramanujan's last notebook or earlier notebooks. Okay, so note that the sum on the left hand side is finite. Uh, because um, when n, of course, gets bigger than x, uh, f of x over n is equal to zero. So that's a finite sum on the left. Okay, and then note, if I put in theta equals one quarter, I get exactly this elementary formula for the summatory function that we got a few minutes ago. And then just recall that we have this hardy ramanujan formula for the summatory function. So it's very interesting because on the left side, when you have a special case, you get something elementary. And on the right-hand side, you get a double series of Bessel functions rather than a single series of Bessel functions. But what we have done is to add a parameter theta, uh, so to speak, to the formula. So there are three ways of looking at the formula. Uh, we can uh, interpret the formula in two ways by reversing the order of summation, uh, or we can interpret the uh, formula as a sum where the product tends to infinity. Yeah. So the big question is, can we use the extra parameter theta to attack uh, the circle problem? I actually, when I came back, skipped uh, one of the transparencies, I actually stated the Ramanujan formula with the order of summation reversed. Uh, Zarescu and I first proved the formula with the summation reversed in 2006, but we could not use the ideas that we had for proving the formula with the summation reversed. We couldn't use these ideas to prove Ramanujan's formula. So we had to wait seven years. And then when we worked again on this with Sun Kim, we were able to prove the formula that Ramanujan stated. And as I said, uh, there's another interpretation. So we have three different interpretations 
under which we prove the formula. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll leave it there. Can we use the extra parameter theta to attack the circle problem? I think this is what Ramanujan was thinking, but we don't have any more, uh, I, nothing more from Ramanujan. We don't know how or why uh, he, was, he, would, he was going to think of, he would use this formula. Okay, so I'm going to return to another result from Ramanujan's first letter to Hardy. So here we take the number of divisors of the natural numbers. So he's indicating them here. One having one divisor, two having two, three having two, four having three, etc. cetera. Then he says the sum of the numbers up to n terms is equal to this, uh, then plus one half the number of divisors of n. So this is optimistic. Uh, this part of the formula is correct, uh, but uh, he was too optimistic about the error term. Uh, gamma here is uh, Euler's constant. So we'll let D of N be the number of positive divisors of the positive integer N. So D of X is our summatory function. Uh, the prime means the same thing as before. And now, just as we did before, I'm going to let n be uh, represented by dj, where d or j is any divisor of n. So I'm summing over all products dj less than or equal to x. I will sum on j first, so I just get square brackets of x over d. So we have this very simple formula for the summatory function. Now, um, Again, I'm letting a divisor D be such that of N and I write N B D J. So for every divisor N, we get a lattice point D J. It's in the first quadrant, D and J are positive divisors and they're under the hyperbola A B equals X. That's because the sum is less than or equal to X. So here D of X is equal to the number of lattice points in the first quadrant under or on the hyperbola uh, AB equals X. So the Dirichlet divisor problem is equivalent to the problem of estimating the number of lattice points under or on this hyperbola. So yeah, here is a picture of a hyperbola AB equals X. So Dirichlet argued in the following way uh, to get an estimate for this number of points. What he did is to look at a square, a radius of uh, side square root x. Then he counted the lattice points in the regions one and two. He counted them in one and three, of course, by symmetry, these numbers are the same, but we've counted these lattice points twice. So we have to subtract off. Okay, so um, here is then Dirichlet's argument. So here is the sum that we want to estimate. Okay, so here is the sum where we only go up to square root x, say vertically. Here is the sum where we only go up to square root x horizontally. And uh, we have to subtract off the number of lattice points in the square. So that's clearly square brackets so square root of x squared. And now we just replace the square brackets of x over d by x over d. So there'll be an error term. Of course, the error term is going to be less than one. And then here we write square root of x as in square brackets as square root of x minus the fractional part. Okay, so now uh, this part just equals big O square root of x. Okay, so all I've done is simplify here. And now we use a formula for approximating the sum, a partial sum of the harmonic series. Okay, so that's what we use here. And then the rest is just the simplification. Okay, so this is exactly what Ramanujan had uh, for the main terms of D of X. And the error term is big O of square root X, as you can see from the calculation above. So Ramanujan, uh, this uh, formula or this problem first attacked by Dirichlet and uh, he gets a 
estimate of big O of square root of X for the remainder. Okay, so here it is uh, summarized. Uh, you might say, what's this one quarter doing here? Why don't we put this in the error term? Well, it turns out that in, in, in analytic um, examinations of this problem, the one quarter just appears, uh, uh, really appears from contour integration a certain, uh, at a certain point. And uh, so it really is inconsequential in terms of the error term. So here is again my summary in the Dirichlet divisor problem asks for the correct order of this error term. Yeah. So there is a formula for the error term uh, analogous to the one we have for the circle problem. So this I1 here is this linear combination of Bessel functions. I won't bother to indicate uh, what these are, uh, but I just want to emphasize that Y nu as an asymptotic formula, very much like we had for the ordinary Bessel function. Uh, here we have a sine instead of a cosine uh, in the asymptotic formula. And the K is inconsequential in terms of error terms because the terms, as you can see, exponentially decrease. So we get an absolutely convergent series from those. Well, uh, this problem was attacked by Warren Oy. Uh, in, two, in 1904, and he showed that the error term is big O of x to the one third log x as x tends to infinity. And the current best result, as far as we know, is due to Huxley again. Uh, so generally, uh, because the asymptotic formulas are very similar, if you have an idea that works for one problem, it'll work for the other problem usually. Okay, so now I'll go to a, the second identity on page 335, and this involves D of N. Okay, so um, here is the formula, second formula of Ramanujan, and um, these linear combinations of Bessel functions occur just like in Voronoi's formula. So we have a double series of Bessel functions analogous to what we had before. So if we take theta to be zero in that formula, we get back the simple formula for the divisor sum that we had uh, just a couple minutes ago. And I remind you what uh, Voronoi's formula is. So again, I emphasize that those Bessel functions are the same as what we have in the double series. Yeah. So the this formula turned out to be more difficult to prove uh, than the other formula. So our first theorem uh, in this regard was of the following nature. If we invert the order of summation and assume convergence for one value of theta, then we can prove the identity for all values of theta. So we had a very unusual hypothesis. This is a hypothesis that uh, we had actually never seen before we had to assume convergence at one value. And if we just have one value, we can get all values then uh, of theta between zero and one. And we can also prove the identity when the product uh, of the indices tends to infinity. And this again was uh, proved in this paper with Sun Kim and Alexander Zaharescu. Okay, now I'm going to take a uh, divergent path here. And you might say, why am I doing this? I will come back to this and you'll see why I'm taking this uh, path uh, apparently far away from what we were talking about. So Gian Watson in the final address that he gave to the London Mathematical Society that is concluding his term as president he gave an account of the mock theta functions of Ramanujan. He calls this the final problem because when Ramanujan returned to India after being in England for five years, he sent Hardy just one letter. And in this letter, he indicated his new discovery of the mock theta functions. So this is why Watson called this the final problem. So he borrowed the term from uh, 
a short story by Sherlock or of Sherlock Holmes stories. There are 24 altogether. And the last one's called The Adventure of the Final Problem. So uh, in England and the US, these are very uh, famous short stories. And moreover, uh, in this short story and all the short stories, Sherlock Holmes' famous sidekick was Dr. Watson. So there are two plays on words, so to speak, for why R Watson chose this title uh, for his presidential address. Yeah. Okay, coming back to the identity uh, in Ramanujan's Lost Notebook, uh, when Andrews and I were over a period of many years examining the entries in the Lost Notebook, the last one remaining was actually this formula of Ramanujan. We couldn't prove this. Uh, and um, Sun Kim's our rescue and I had, had worked on this for several years. So I indicate or I emphasize that the theorem we proved was with the order of summation reversed. So this was our final problem. And fortunately, the final problem has been solved. And it was solved by uh, Zarescu, his student, Junxian Li. And uh, we borrowed Watson's term, and we called our paper the final problem in identity from Ramanujan's Lost Notebook. So we followed Watson's example and published this in the journal of the London Mathematical Society last year. So if you would like a uh, uh, a less technical uh, account of this problem. We've written uh, a less technical paper in the volume dedicated to George Andrews uh, on his 80th birthday. And uh, these are the six editors. And I'm told it will be published on the very last day of this year. And here is a picture of Junxian Li and my colleague Alexander Zaharescu. So let me just uh, mention a few things about this proof. So I'll just give a, just a sketch. So that series does not converge absolutely. We have to use asymptotic formulas to get a convergent series, or this is what we work with. So again, we these are these asymptotic formulas we use. So the key idea is, is the following. So in those uh, double series of Bessel functions, we have these radicals in the denominator. So what we did is to introduce complex variables by replacing the square root by a complex variable S or W. Then. And then what we did is to show that we have uniform convergence with respect to theta on various subintervals with respect to uh, W and S. So I won't go over these. I'll just, just indicate them quickly. Um, for my sketch here, the argument, they're, they're not important, but the, they are, of course, important in the proof. So we have to consider the case when X is an integer from when X is not an integer. And then we have to divide the interval on X um, or theta, uh, I so this, excuse me, the summation variables into large and small values of M and N and estimate the sums in order to prove the uniform convergence. We multiply both sides by sine squared pi theta to get rid of the singularities. We put the Bessel functions on one side and then we calculate the Fourier series of the uh, slightly amended identity. So we can do this because we've shown that the series converge uniformly uh, on any compact interval from zero to one. Yeah. Okay, so we can apply the um, Fourier series analysis and that briefly is how we prove uh, the identity. So you might ask, uh, are there any other identities of this type? So you might think of it this way, x squared plus y squared is a positive definite quadratic form. Might there exist similar formulas for other positive de definite quadratic forms? And there actually are. We 
have some other results of this type. So we'll let R3 of n be the number of representations of n as a sum of this quadratic form, but we require that three not divide m. So then uh, we get a formula for the sum of R3 of n, analogous to what we had for R2 of n, and it's in terms of Bessel functions. And as you can sort of see here, uh, what we did is to substitute theta to be one sixth in this formula. So also from the ideas that we used uh, in our papers uh, attacking Ramanujan's uh, formulas, uh, in fact, we wrote, uh, I think about four or five such four papers, uh, we could also apply them to examine trigonometric sums. So here is a sum on products of uh, two sine functions. So remember in the two formulas that I had, we had one sine function, but we had square brackets uh, function or a cosine function as in the case of the divisor problem. Okay, let me just briefly indicate, uh, in, introduce characters here. So chi one and chi two are non-principal primitive odd characters modulo P and Q. So I'm going to replace sigma by A over P, uh, A and P relatively prime and theta by B over Q. And then I'll define uh, this sort of sum of divisors. So D of chi one chi two is the sum over all divisors of N of chi one of D, chi two of N over D. So this is completely analogous to D of N. So there, D would divide N and we would have one. And then N over D would be J in our previous notation, and this would be one. So in other words, we have the sum of all, over all divisors of N. So this is a generalization, you might say, not quite a generalization because uh, we assume that the characters are non-principal here, not just identically one for all values uh, of uh, P and Q. Okay, and then uh, what we did is to derive a formula for this sum of signs with uh, sigma and theta specialized as A over P and B over Q. Okay, so this is our formula. Uh, as you can see, it's somewhat complicated. This is Euler's phi function. And these are what are called Gauss sums. Okay, if you haven't had these before, uh, don't worry about it. Um, but what I want to emphasize is that this representation is given as a sum of these divisor functions. So let me just return to that. This is our sum of divisor functions. So it's a bit different from before because I have an N here. Okay, so we have that the sum is a linear combination of these sums D star. Okay, so can we examine these sums like uh, Hardy examine the sum for R2 of n, n less than or equal to x? Well, we have just limited success. We can make a conjecture that the sum uh, SS here is omega plus or minus of x to the five fourths. So remember that for Hardy's conjecture, uh, the five fourths was replaced by one quarter. So we think this is correct, but we don't know how to prove it. Okay, but we can prove a big O result uh, for the sum. So we show that the big O result is big O of x to the 17 twelfths plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. Okay, so uh, here the difference between what we think and what we have is not quite as great as before. So here is the decimal expansion of 17 twelfths. Here's five fourths. So we have a difference of a little over 0.16. So um, uh, we think that this is the correct result, or that is our conjecture. 
So again, just like in Hardy's case, we think that really the sum is big O of X to the five force plus epsilon for every epsilon greater than zero. But again, just like we have for the circle problem and the divisor problem, uh, we just don't know, but we think that's correct. Okay, let me look at just a special case of uh, our formula. I'm going to take theta and sigma to both, both be a quarter. Okay, so we have our character then looks like this. You know, it's one, zero, zero, minus one. Well, in fact, here is our sine function right here. Okay, and uh, so check this is very simple here. So I plug that in to our formula for the signs. And because only the odd ones survive, I'm going to replace the M and N by 2J plus one and 2K plus one. Okay, so here is our minus ones. They become this one. Sorry here. Okay, so this is somewhat of an interesting lattice point problem. So what we are doing is counting lattice points under the hyperbola again, but now instead of counting them, we're actually putting them in. Uh, these are our lattice points and they're only with odd index. Uh, so note that every square uh, associated with the lattice point, so the before associated lattice points, there will always be one where the uh, coordinates are odd. Okay, so we are counting lattice points under the hyperbola, uh, but they're now only odd and we're putting a weight on them. That is minus one to the J plus K. Yeah. Okay, so our conjectures and theorems apply to this as a special case. Yeah. Well, we can also prove an identity uh, for a K-fold sum of signs like this. I won't give the identity at all. Okay, so uh, some of what I just said is in a paper that I wrote with Sun Kim and uh, my colleagues are rescue uh, in this paper in Krella's journal in 2013. But some of the things I've said are in uh, process uh, research that I'm doing uh, with Martino Fasana, Sun Kim and Alexander Zaharescu. Uh, Martino is a recent uh, PhD graduate of the University of Illinois. Yeah. So this is just in pro progress and uh, uh, our research is far com from complete. <clears throat> so here is uh, a picture of Martino. Uh, Padua is his hometown. This is a very famous basilica. I've given you a, a more recent picture of Sun Kim. And uh, this is uh, my colleague without his beard. Yeah. So at the moment, he doesn't have a beard. Well, let me put this in a somewhat more general uh, setting. Uh, so let me just briefly uh, describe this. So Chandra Saker and Anera Simon considered very general Dirichlet series. So usually these lambdas will be a product of n, like pi n, and likewise for these mu's, usually a, you know, like pi or two pi times n. It's two pi times n for the circle problem. So we form these Dirichlet series, and we assume that they satisfy a functional equation. So this is, uh, for those of you who know the functional equation for the Riemann zeta function, uh, this is very similar, a generalization of that functional equation. Okay, uh, this is just technical. So uh, let me just go to the last uh, formula here. So this is sort of a theta function formula. Uh, if lambda n were n or n squared, uh, we would have a theta function and if a n is one. Uh, and then here we have uh, another theta function. So usually the lambda n and mu n are, are the same. And x goes into one over x. So if you have that functional equation, what Chandrasekhar and Narasimhan are saying 
is that you also have a theta relation. And if you have a theta relation, you also have a functional equation. So these two uh, formulas are equivalent. And there's another equivalent formula. So this parameter rho is bigger than two sigma a star minus r minus a half. This is the abscissive absolute convergence for the psi function. And if you recall, r is that number which appears in the functional equation. Well, let me just skip this now. It uh, gives you this arises from poles of chi. So here we have what is called a resum identity. So what we were considering is the case when rho is equal to zero, just the sum of a n, for example, r2 of n or, or d of n. Then. But you can get more general formulas than what I gave you uh, from Hardy and Ramanujan and Voronoi. And note that there are Bessel functions on the right-hand side of this uh, formula. Okay, so here I, I just indicated. So the uh, uh, functional equation implies the Reese fun, fun, uh, identity. That is that identity I just gave you. And the Reese sum identity implies the functional equation. So the upshot of all this is that the functional equation, the modular relation or theta function relation and the Reese sum identity uh, these are all equivalent. If you have one, then, then you have the other uh, identity, other two identities. Okay, let me give you an example. Uh, this is the definition of Ramanujan's tau function. Then. Okay, so you just take this product, expand it, uh, and the coefficients are what Ramanujan called the tau function. Okay, so let's apply the theorem of Chandra Saker and Anera Simon uh, to the Dirichlet series involving the tau function. Well, it satisfies a functional equation of this type. Here, the R would be 12. And this is the theta relation. Now, the good thing about this theta relation, or one good thing, is that uh, the function chi of S that is the left-hand side of the functional equation, is an entire function. So you don't get any extra terms because it's an entire function. And here is the resum identity in this case then. So the theorem is that all three of these are equivalent. If you have this functional equation, you have the theta or modular relation, and you have the resum identity. Okay, so this uh, is the uh, paper of Chandra Saker and Nara Simon, uh, where these equivalent identities uh, are found and proved in general. Okay, so let me just discuss one more topic. So I mentioned earlier that uh, Andrews and I came down to one formula uh, which was proved a little over a year ago by Junshian Li, Zarreski, and myself. So are there statements in the, law, in the earlier notebooks and the lost notebook that we don't understand? And the answer is actually yes, there are such statements. So let me just uh, briefly discuss one of them. So it has to do with Ramanujan's theta functions. So I didn't write it down here. The sum f of a, b, I forgot to do this, is the sum of a to the n, n plus one over two, b to the n, n minus one over two, sum from minus infinity to infinity. I apologize for getting to write down the definition. And this is the Jacobi triple product identity for the theta function. I'm using a familiar notation uh, in the theory of uh, Q series. A Q infinity is the limit of A Q N. And uh, this is the definition of A Q N, this product of uh, N terms. So note that we let N tend to infinity in the definition of the Ramanujan tau function and took the 24th power of it. And uh, here are the three most famous and useful theta functions. Uh, again, I forgot to write down the theta 
the summatory function, but here are the summatory functions for these three uh, theta functions. So this is the most common of all theta functions. This generates the triangular numbers and this generates the pentagonal numbers. So three special cases then of Ramanujan's general theta function. Okay, so I wanna concentrate on phi. So uh, in particular, we want to look at values of phi of e to the minus pi n, or maybe when the n is replaced by a square root of n. There are lots of motivations for actually looking at these. In particular, if you can evaluate one of these phi's, you can actually also evaluate what's called an elliptic integral. And you can also evaluate at the same time a hypergeometric function. So here is a classical uh, one just when n is one. Uh, this is, was discovered long ago, probably by Gauss. So here is one which is a little bit more difficult and Ramanujan submitted this as a problem in the journal of the Indian Mathematical Society um, during his uh, late stay in England. Well, here is a really difficult one. So we'll, this is what's called a class invariant, but we can skip that. So G is just this very complicated expression involving square roots of 13. You can see it's a horrible looking expression. This A is uh, in terms of G. Well, we can get a formula for phi of e to the minus 13 pi over phi of e to the minus pi. Remember that we can actually calculate this. So it's this expression in terms of uh, G or in terms of A. So as N increases indeed, uh, these formulas do increase uh, in difficulty. And, uh, and so it's a challenge actually to find formulas and Ramanujan found about six or eight of these uh, formulas. Well, in the lost notebook, there is an, uh, Ramanujan writes for example, and he's looking at phi of e to the minus seven pi square root seven. So this is uh, the, theta function phi again. And here he, um, he doesn't put in the missing terms. So what are the missing terms? And the answer is we don't know what the missing terms are. However, um, we have uh, a guess as to what these are. And I am now writing with the person who's most responsible for this guess and uh, we think he actually has a proof. And uh, we are preparing a paper uh, with this title and it will appear in a special issue of the Hardy Ramanujan Journal uh, in memory of Ramanujan on the 100th anniversary of his passing. So let me just uh, sort of summarize some of the main points. Can we use these extra parameters uh, and for sums of squares and divisor function identities to attack the famous circle and divisor problems? Uh, I would love to know how Ramanujan was thinking about these formulas. And uh, do there exist analogs of these two formulas for other arithmetical functions? Our motivation for asking this question is that the double series of Bessel functions are involve the same Bessel functions as for the singly infinite series. So here we have you know, infinite series representations for the summatory function in terms of Bessel functions. Are there doubly infinite series representations? We don't know. There are remaining a few entries that uh, we don't understand. But still, we don't know Ramanujan's thoughts, not only on these entries, but uh, on many others as well. So thank you very much for your invitation uh, to speak with you. I'll be glad to yeah. take it. Yeah, thank questions. you, Professor Burnt, for a very, very nice talk. So I think let's open up the floor for uh, uh, any questions and discussions. Uh, Professor Prasanna, you heard the 
you know you asked a question at the beginning could you please repeat that again do we know ramajam's thoughts on some of these things as to how he actually came up with these identities and his uh, mathematics now this is i think i'm sure bruce has spent his lifetime uh, on this so in many cases we actually can uh, construct ramanujan's thinking um so for example for some but not all of those values of theta functions that ramanujan found we're quite certain that he used modular equations uh, to find uh, these values Ramanujan loved the modular equations. In his notebooks, there are between one and 200 of them, but they get more complicated as the uh, value of uh, n increases. So there's a degree attached to each of these modular equations. So when the degree increases, then it becomes much more difficult uh, to calculate the values of the theta function, the modular equations become much more complicated. So there are a couple of values of uh, the theta function phi for which Ramanujan has values, but he doesn't have any uh, modular equations attached to these values. So we don't know how he argued. Did he really have modular equations uh, for getting these values? Or did he have some other method for calculating the values of the state of function? We just don't know. We think he probably had another method, uh, which we don't know, but we're just not sure of that. So there are a lot of uh, uh, areas that, problems that Ramanujan worked on where we're fairly sure that uh, Ramanujan used such and such ideas, but there are others like the one I just mentioned where we just don't know how Ramanujan thought. Yeah, thank you, Professor Burn. So I have a question, how much of Ramanujan is still left to be discovered? I know it's, it's not an easy question to answer, but I just want to hear your words. So to be discovered or to be proved? Uh, so, okay. uh, so I think we've you know, discovered uh, everything there is. In fact, uh, uh, I, uh, I have actually more words to say about this. As, you know, as I've been going through thinking about Ramanujan's work for over 40 years, you know, occasionally I think about uh, when he wrote stuff, how much has been lost, etc. So I've been thinking about this again uh, very much and uh, I could sort of give a 20 or 30 minute lecture, I guess, on this. Uh, so in particular, um, there are things that have been lost, I'm quite sure, uh, as I indicated uh, about the two expressions or two formulas in Hardy's paper that Ramanujan gave him. So Ramanujan wrote to Hardy from nursing homes we have about uh, seven or eight letters that he wrote to Hardy. Not everything in those letters uh, has been proved. Uh, and there are letters which have been lost. So um, the, you know, this is material that, you know, might not have appeared uh, elsewhere. And um, in the letters that Ramanujan wrote to Hardy that we have, some pages have been lost. So for the first letter, two pages have actually been lost in that letter. And uh, for the last letter that Ramanujan wrote from India, uh, at least one page has been lost from that letter. So um, there are things that Ramanujan did which uh, unfortunately have been lost. And uh, so how much has been lost, uh, we don't know. Um, I had two conversations with Janaki, uh, Ramanujan's wife, and in each of those, uh, she said that when Ramanujan returned from India, he had a whole trunk full of papers. Uh, she also told this, I remember, to uh, other people like uh, Chandra Sekar, and uh, I think the newspaper 
uh, in Madras or Chennai. And so she said that to uh, others rather than just, you know, not just to me. So the question is, you know, have all those papers been preserved? And it doesn't look like it, uh, you know, from what uh, description she gave. So uh, we're, even though we have this enormous amount from Urbanajan, uh, there are things obviously that have been lost. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, any questions from anyone? Yeah, I have just one. Um, the I think it was Delin who proved uh, the <laughs> equation about the tau function, Ramanjam's conjecture, if I remember uh, anything. Uh, yeah, so did it, were, do you know after, I mean, that was quite a while back, several de decades back, but do you think that uh, with the, in hindsight, with the further development of mathematics, you would have found some other way, way by which math, uh, Ramanjam would have done it because I don't think he had any knowledge of algebraic geometry, at least the way it, it modern mathematics deals with it. That's a very good question. I, I've thought about this a lot. You know. So yeah, Ramanujan's conjecture, it's a conjecture on tau of p, where p is a prime. Um, so if I remember correctly, the absolute value of tau of p is at p to the 11 halves, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, so Ramanujan evidently did not prove that. So how he made the conjecture, uh, we don't know. Uh, he, it would be really wonderful to have his insights uh, behind his conjecture. So this conjecture has just generated an enormous amount of research in the last uh, few decades. Like the, did Lean prove this in 1974, if I remember correctly? I'm not quite sure. Um, so it, it has many, many generalizations and it implies lots of things. And uh, yeah, it's uh, a motivating force and has been for hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of papers. And uh, But I, I just don't have any you know, intuition as to really how he actually came up with the conjecture. He calculated a lot of values of tau of n, but not enough to make the conjecture, I don't think. Everybody says that while it's not generally, um, his name is not directly associated, Ramanjam's work ultimately was very important in the proof of Fermat's last theorem in that Galois representations and so on, at least some of it was inspired by his results. I don't know. I don't know either. I, I yeah, um, for the, you know, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Ramanujan never worked on Fermat's last theorem. And I'm not an expert on the proof. I've never, uh, the proof is something that involves mathematics about which I don't know. So I don't think that there was anything in Ramanujan's mathematics that inspired the proof. But uh, since I'm not an expert on this, I, I can't say that uh, my conjecture is true about that. So if there aren't any questions, then let's thank Professor Burnt again. So we are fortunate to listen to you in 2009, now in uh, 2020, and uh, we really wish to uh, listen to you again in 2030. Okay, <laughs> maybe a little earlier than 2030. Oh, yeah, yes, sure. <laughs> so thank you, Professor Burnt, again. You're very welcome. Thank Glad you. to give the lecture. Good seeing you, all of you. Yeah. Well, whoever I could see here. So this concludes okay. our, our RMIT mini virtual mini conference. So thanks to Professor Jaya for uh, uh, providing all the support. And also I would like to thank the co-organizers, Professor Prasanna and Professor Manisha Kulkarni. So, and also Professor Sadakopan for providing uh, the encouragement and support. So, yeah, thank you and uh, see you next time.